So we're here at the Lenara Connect, and uh, who are you? I'm Ed Vilmedi. Um, I'm here from Packet. Uh, we uh, do bare metal hosting, and I'm here for the Works on ARM project. So Packet uh, does uh, servers and stuff like that? Yeah, so we have servers in 15 data centers. Um, four of those data centers have ARM-based servers in them. Uh, we use Cavium uh, Thunder X uh, right now, and the project that I'm working on also has access to server gear from uh, Qualcomm and other vendors uh, for test and uh, continuous integration, continuous development, just getting people access to gear that they wouldn't have uh, typically sitting on their desktop. So it's really awesome. So um, in theory, I could maybe sign up and run and host uh, ARM devices on a real ARM server. Yeah, so we have a, a bunch of servers that are uh, available for commercial use. Um, the Thunder X goes for 50 cents an hour, and you can rent it by the hour or by the month. Um, the project also has a pool of uh, servers for uh, subsidized use. So some of the reasons that I'm here is to talk to people in various projects who are doing interesting things that maybe have access to some hardware but not enough, or they're doing uh, testing on ARM and need, need access to machines that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. So, um so 50 cents an hour, that's for the whole server? Yeah, that's for the whole server. So the, one of the differences between Packet and other hosting organizations is that we do bare metal hosting, which means you get the whole server. You're not going through a hypervisor. You're not being virtualized. Um, if you want to bring your own hypervisor, that's fine. Uh, or bring your own virtualization tools, but that's up to you. And uh, what we find is that gives us access to people who are either doing workloads that are sufficiently big that they know that they need the whole machine, or uh, people doing really interesting projects where they need very low level access to hardware. Um, and we don't have a lot of, um, we don't offer a lot of services above the hardware. Um, we're not opinionated about what people do. Uh, we just want to provide people with uh, access to the fundamental infrastructure that they need to get things done. And it includes unlimited bandwidth, or I'm just joking. So, that yeah, it so the bandwidth works. Um, you get charged for egress bandwidth, um, and you get charged for bandwidth between data centers, but not within the same data center. So generally, the bandwidth charge, um, uh, I don't remember the exact price, but it, it, it turns out to be a mod, unless you're doing large sort of things it turns out to be a modest part, portion of what people actually pay. How does it compare with the price of a uh, Xeon pro, uh, server? So, um, the, the ARM hardware is interesting. We, we offer um, five kinds of Intel machines and one ARM system. So, uh, people are using Xeon systems. The Type 2 server, which is the most comparable server, is about $1.50 an hour, um, so the ARM stuff comes in lower, uh, the, so it's a, aggressively priced. Um, people doing, doing systems development on a server that has 96 cores have to think in a different way than people doing stuff on a server with fewer, faster cores, and uh, we're really encouraged by the next generation of, of server hardware that we're starting to see in the lab where uh, the cores have gotten appreciably faster. So that's the Thunder X1 or Thunder X2? The Thunder X2 has, has faster cores. Um, we don't have any good benchmark data yet because it's all really new. I mean, we have very early, early production stuff, but definitely the server trajectory is going in the right direction. So uh, the Thunder X2 is going to be available? Um, that's our plan. We don't know when the quantity production is going to be yet. We're still talking with, uh, with our vendors to make sure that we uh, can understand how to deploy it best. But yeah, that is the plan. And uh, then there, there might be some solutions uh, from Qualcomm, maybe something from High Silicon. Yeah, so um, the Qualcomm gear that we have right now is uh, their, early, their early bring up board. Uh, we have some of those, not a whole lot. It's not public what, how it works, right? Um, so quite a bit of that is not very public. What's public? We've, we actually had at um, 
at the show in Los Angeles Open Source Summit, we had a, the exact motherboard that we're running. Um, and they're planning an announcement sometime soon. soon. So uh, hopefully, I mean, you, I don't want to get any secrets out, but <laughs> it's, it might be quite good. It, it's going to be a very interesting machine. It's a very competitive, very competitive product. And it's just a very interesting, um, you know, as, as we see this year's group of servers, it's clear that everyone has made progress in silicon. Um, it's clear that everyone uh, has made progress on operating systems, that they're easier to boot than they were the first time, easier to bring up. The kernel support has, has come a long way, um, just generally making it possible to ingest these systems into our environment and bring them initially to a select group of people, but with the full thought that we're going to be able to expand that out. And have you looked at the Socionex solution? or? I was just over at their booth. Um, that may be possible. Uh, yeah, so too? yeah, that's that's one of the things that we've had conversations with. I'm not going to promise any anything because um, I think the one of the really interesting opportunities is to have a edge compute device that's ARM based that would be in data centers closer to where the problems where the workload is. So if you're doing something like um, self-driving cars or whatever, that your data center for processing that data would be in the same metro as the vehicles that are there. And uh, uh, Huawei, High Silicon has been developing five generations as far as I know of ARM servers and they have the six kind of like secret one coming out. Have you any access to any of the High Silicon stuff? We do have access to High Silicon. Um, it's very limited um, at this point to people who are doing fundamental work uh, you know, again, the hypervisor, and you know, it's, it's not generally available yet, but we've we've had some really good results with it. So, how old is Packet? How, how long has Packet been doing this? Uh, uh, Packet this was founded in 2014 and um, had its first customers in 2015, so still fairly new. Um, like a startup. It is a startup. Um, the founders had experience with at other hosting firms, so they've been in the business 15 plus years. Um, Could be a VH or a host or something. Yeah, so it's it's an interesting it's an interesting group of people. It's, I'm really happy working with these this group of coworkers. Um, the team is scattered around. There's a core group in New York City, and then there's remote people doing. Um, system management and customer support um, in enough time zones that we have 24-hour coverage. And some people locally in each of the data centers? Uh, we have remote hands when we need them, but we don't typically maintain offices everywhere that we have stuff. Our main office is in, in uh, New York City, uh, near World Trade, and uh, the data centers in New Jersey. And the remote hands are like ready quickly? Smart, quickly. You know, when, ready, ready quickly needed. when you need them, yeah. All oh, right, and so um, there's so much, so many people in the world, and everybody needs more and more uh, stuff, like uh, more and more smart apps and mm -hmm. websites and stuff. And maybe there is not going to be possible to run everything only on Intel servers. We need to maybe there, there might be a huge future with this ARM server stuff, right? Yeah. So I think the future is is very positive. Um, the challenge is always finding that match of workload to um, price, performance, and power consumption. Um, ARM servers, by their nature, have some advantage on the price and power consumption front. Uh, performance uh, is getting better. I won't say that uh, it's better per core, but it's uh, comparable per socket. And if, you're, if, you're, if your uh, task lends itself to lots of threads um, relatively I.O. bound rather than a few threads relatively CPU bound, then it's very, it's very plausible that uh, an existing workload could move over from Intel to ARM without doing a lot of work and without, without too much risk. So, so this might be uh, the, the year things are happening. Um, in a big way, maybe. The, the, do, you, do you see any uh, potential uh, huge wave of, of adoption into this kind of solution? So part of the challenge has been availability of gear. Um, 
there's no shortage of people who are interested. Um, the hard part is that some of this equipment is, is still hard to buy. Um, and just getting the supply chain ramped up so that if someone put in an order for you know, 2,000 nodes, that we could fulfill that even um, is, I guess, a challenge. Um, you know, it's maturing. I think when I got started with this stuff um, almost a year ago, um, there was a lot of uncertainty about how well the software worked. And a year's worth of software development has cured most of the obvious defects and really raised the bar so that people assume, can assume fairly easily that an ARM port is an easy port rather than an unknown. Um, and and that's, that's been a big difference. Do you have many customers already, or is it a secret? Uh, how many people are trying this out, or using it actually, the ARM? Um, so we have, what's the right way of answering that? You don't have to say if it's yeah. a secret. It might be a trade secret. Well, yeah. The, the um, overall packet platform sees about 50,000 deploys a month. So people deploy their servers, tear them down when they're done, or deploy it and keep them. Um, the ARM servers are a fraction of our total workload. Um, they tend right now to be more focused on the development test integration front rather than on the production workloads. But um, for the people for whom those production workloads work out, um, it's, a, it's a big win. Um, it's a big win. Uh, I can imagine like a huge company like Google and Amazon and all these guys and Facebook, right. they've been probably testing it out for a while, secretly. Not so testing, secretly. Testing everything out, tr trying, 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 and then at one point suddenly, maybe they decide to build a whole data center, just ARM. And that's when, when that happens suddenly, you, you'll be very, very busy with everybody who wants to switch to ARM maybe suddenly. It, it could happen it any could day. It could happen in any day. Yeah, the, um, the tipping point is when you have complete parity on the software front and an advantage on the hardware front. Um, the Intel systems in general have more mature software just because more people have been using them. So part of the challenge is getting people's level of confidence up. On the hardware front, um, the you know Moore's law has changed. You can't just count on the next revision having a process improvement drive everything forward. And so what we're seeing in general is instead of individual cores getting faster, more and more and more cores in the system. And so I think. It's hard. And, you know, is it going to be this year? Is it going to be next year? Uh, there's a lot of work still to be done, but there's, but uh, there's a lot of projects that are at parity, where, uh, where uh, if you are running uh, Intel and ARM, you don't know the difference. Um, and then it just again, it's price performance and uh, and power usage. When you were mentioning before about the single-threaded performance might not be as high as Intel. But is there any chance with the Thunder X2 and with the new Qualcomm stuff and maybe with the new next upcoming Huawei uh, High Silicon, maybe they're getting there? Even, they're in, e even in the single-threaded yeah, stuff? Yes, single-threaded stuff has definitely seen improvements. Again, I don't have any... Numbers are a little bit hard to say because the total system performance, the, the per-core performance is definitely getting better. Um, you know, if I had only one core, I would probably be not as happy. But these systems are all many core systems. You know, they all start at 48 or 55 cores or whatnot, or 56 cores. Um, the Thunder X2 has four threads per core, so something like HTOP reports 224 threads. Now, how you write software that uses all of those effectively is probably the next challenge, not just for ARM, but for, for Intel as well, or, or even for AMD, where you, know, you have to worry about schedulers, uh, non-uniform memory access, uh, caches get more and more important, um, trying to make sure that your, uh, your process doesn't wander between cores and uh, lose all of its cache co consistency. 
So there's there's a lot of work that you you solve one problem and you discover fairly quickly that that gives you another opportunity to solve more problems. Has uh, uh, Intel Xeon had uh, in the last few years lots of cores, or what's uh, Intel Xeon kind of core um, amounts usually? So they've been growing. So no no Intel chip that I've seen, no Intel chip that we have has as many cores as the ARM systems have. Usually cores. it's like 16 or 16 eight? or 16 or 24. There are some 24. There are 24 ones. ones yeah. yeah. Um, the um, the at, at that number of cores, again, the other things start to become really important. Um, uh, how much L3 cache there is on the, on the chip, um, how well it does memory access. Um, and so, at, and, I, and I think um, there's still work to be done at the application layer to really take advantage of these really high core counts. One of the maybe main uh, differentiators for the ARM solutions is that they, they can customize all kinds of stuff on the SOC. They yeah. can do the networking, they can do power, power management, maybe, I don't know, all kinds of things on the SOC that maybe Intel has kind of woken up and tried to do as well recently, or? Yeah, so the ARM, I mean, the ARM world is, is fan, a bunch of fantastic beasts, right? You have um, systems that have a really high level of integration, you have um, system designed for data centers that have some features and don't have some other features. Um, a lot of the data center focused machines are 64-bit only, whereas the chips that were traditionally coming out of the phone world um, often had 32-bit modes in them. Um, there's GPU integration, just all sorts of stuff. And as hardware gets more diverse, um, it gets more possible that you're working on systems where the hardware that you have gives you an unfair advantage over a software-only solution. And so I think the ARM world is uniquely poised to take advantage of that hardware diversity. And uh, so how long have you been uh, uh, following or hanging around with the, the narrow guys and what, what do, you, do you think they're solving some of the, many of the issues or many yeah. of the challenges and making all this Happen? Yeah, so um, I've been doing um, internet stuff for about 30 years now. Um, I found uh, the Raspberry Pi, like a lot of people found the Raspberry Pi a couple years back, used it as a industrial controller for a solar energy plant. Um, got involved with uh, the Cavium stuff about a year ago and immediately found Lenaro in that world. And just following, you know, I got involved in ARM a little bit late compared to people who can say, oh yeah, I've been working on these problems for five years. I've got a year into it now, specifically at the server side. Um, I think the, the, the challenge that everyone has is for these servers to be completely reliable and completely boring, like you don't even know what you're running on and everything just works. Um, Every single problem that gets found and solved has to be upstream. Um, and if you can get to the point where you've upstreamed all of the all the things, then packages and pr programs and whatnot uh, just work. Um, and at some point, it gets very boring. I mean, to be honest. And boring is good. Boring is is so good. You do not want excitement in your data center. So, uh, so. You, you, you do some tweeting, <coughs> and you, you call it works on ARM? Yeah. So what, it, what are you doing on there, and what are you looking for? So works on ARM is a um, project that is funded by ARM, uh, run by Packet. Um, I'm the lead on it. We've got about five people with some level of involvement on it, plus people from various um, chip makers and from ARM itself and from Lenaro and a, a, a good-sized crew of folks. Um, the strategy is to put together a website that has a comprehensive directory of all the software that works in the ARM platform, complete with current information about versions and distributions, complete with um, uh, honest discussion of bugs that are blockers potentially for things, 
um, pointers to uh, distributions and to um, containers that run these sorts of things. Uh, I put together a weekly newsletter that has a distribution that goes out to a bunch of folks. Um, I tweet because I know how to tweet. Um, and uh, we regularly meet in a, in a group that uh, talks about various, um, various issues that have come up, trying to be strategic about using the resources that we have. Uh, Works on Arm has a few dozen machines that we currently have and we're getting more for uh, people doing CI and for uh, bring up and testing and uh, getting people access to hardware who wouldn't otherwise have the hardware on their desk. And uh, it's, been, it's been good. It's been, you know, it started out as like, hey, we get these servers, what works, right? And has transformed fairly quickly into, uh, hey, we have all these servers and we know that a bunch of things work and not only can we tell you that with some authority, but uh, we can give you code that you can run yourself and uh, prove it to yourself that it's, that it's all working. So the challenge I see for the coming year is more and more demos that are already ready to go, uh, more and more uh, CI CD loops so that people can prove out on a development level that everything is working, um, and just general community awareness. So uh, as an example, could you, uh uh, like one interesting example that might have been recent of uh, some 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 stuff that works in ARM. Sure. So one of the um, one of the big uh, computer languages that's relatively new that gets used for a lot of new cloud native uh, workloads is Go or GoLang. Um, and when I got to the project, Go was at version 1.6. Um, it had one very small bug that I. F it, Anything has bugs, right? But it had one particular bug that caused Docker not to work in certain heavy duty workload characteristics. So over the span of about six months, we found the bug, uh, upstreamed the patch, um, got Docker to include it in their next release, um, uh, set up uh, Go, uh, continuous integration on packets so that uh, Go is building their latest version of uh, the language, testing every check-in, making sure everything, every check-in works, and uh, getting it to the point where at Go 1.9, ARM is a supported platform uh, for Go, and they deliver binaries for it. So it's one of these things like, you know, is that a great demo? No, it doesn't look super great on the screen, but it's fundamental enabling infrastructure that lets dozens or hundreds of other packages have confidence that what they're doing is the right thing. So it's uh, also kind of like a little community where people send in uh, uh, test results or suggestions or yeah. uh, questions? We have a Slack channel, like everyone has a Slack channel. Um, we have uh, regular communication with people on other projects. There's, um, I get email from various people. The Twitter following is uh, people noticing things. So, you know, it's generally a useful way of co collecting a community together. But it's relatively new, but uh, potentially uh, it's going to get very busy very soon, right? Hopefully. I mean, I've been doing videos Hopefully. about the ARM servers for five, six years now. <coughs> and But this might be it. This might be happening right now. So, so it, like I say, if it does happen, then it's going to be huge. Yeah, so as, um, as people build out, so the ARM in the IoT space is really well established and really well understood. Single board computers likewise. I mean, there's, there's some that are very, very popular and some that have a lot of variety to them and there's a lot of ferment there. The ARM desktop, uh, Socionext has their new product that will be very interesting. I'm, Hopeful that they won't be the only one selling things in that form factor because it's a really great, great sort of system design. Um, ARM laptops are f sort of scarce, but um, uh, it's possible to do that with, yeah. with your creative. That's what I use. Yeah. Um, and uh, and then ARM in the server room is just the next, the next thing to do. Uh, and, and I'm not I'm not, not going to make any predictions of whether it's this year or 
next year or five years from now. Um, I don't think it's five years from now. I think it's coming soon. But again, it's a matter of um, commercial viability. It's a matter of, of not just individuals standing behind things, but companies standing behind things. And uh, the hardware are getting to a point where it's uh, price and performance competitive with everything else. Because when you say you compared with the system number two, type two for the Intel, right. which you say is the uh, equivalent, more or less. More or less. Yeah. Then uh, and it's three times cheaper. Is it because it consumes three times less power, or is it because you're being nice? You, are you being subsidized by ARM or something? Um, so are we being nice whenever you introduce something new into a market? Normally it should be high price, no? In, well, because it's like an experimental thing that's scarce. It's not. It's not easy to get access to the hardware. So maybe it, in theory it should actually have been more expensive. But there, there is a a a, a, a theory of. Uh, uh, online pricing everything you should always be charging more right that whatever you're doing you're probably not charging enough for it um, it was uh, well so packet is interesting because like arm packet has softbank as an investor um, and so it was a strategic move for us to move out of the purely intel world into the arm world Um, uh, Zach and Jacob, the two of the founders, and Aaron, who's going to be here tomorrow giving a keynote, um, really have this vision not just of what are we doing this year, but what does the internet look like in 10 years. And uh, Packet's motto is build a better internet. Um, we really think that we're onto something, that the access to bare metal, unopinionated, um, at the data center and at the edge of the network is really important and that a variety of hardware to serve a variety of needs is a really good strategy. Um, the, the hope is that by doing things in this market, we, uh, we spur on more and more people to say, hey, you know, if we have a system on a chip that can scale up the data center size, we have some idea of what it would take to get things into people's hands and build systems that could be done at scale. But for the equivalent Intel, is it really something like three times cheaper to run? Because you are selling at three times cheaper price. Yeah, so it's not an equivalent machine. No two machines are going to be equivalent. The Cavian box has a lot more cores. Um, has lots of RAM. Has lots of RAM. So for, lots of storage? For, for, Uh, enough storage. We have Similar a block. Storage. We have a block storage solution. Yeah. So, if people need lots of storage, we have we have ways of doing that. It's, um, is it? Uh, why is it a third the price? Well, you put your finger in the air and you say, what's the right price for this going into a market? Should it be? Uh, if it's the same price, people will look at it and expect it to be the same thing. Um, we think it's uh, competitively priced. Um, but, but does it use less power? Um, it's uh, does it use less power per core? Certainly, but it has more cores. So uh, it doesn't use enough less power to make it um, fanless, uh, yeah. which uh, which is a goal, right? But in the data center, you have you have resources. The Thunder X2 actually, when we first got it, ran a bit hot, and I think we've corral some of that. Um, you know, the power, the power thing um, is uh, s vendors can make a, make a series of choices, right? Um, the more, the better the process that you have, generally the, the more power advantages you have. Um, If you run at a lower clock speed, you consume less power. So if you do a lower clock speed with lots of cores, the ARM design is just more efficient, but still you're trying to pack a lot of computing power into the box. So, uh, you know, it's a six and one half a dozen the other issue. Cool. But uh, so I guess it's going to be very interesting uh, near future. The, yeah. What's going to happen soon? Uh, there's going to be maybe an ARM TechCon with some kind of announcement. I'm guessing, or maybe not, or some 
because uh, they say they want to be 25% of the server market by 2020 they... and maybe they still mean that it's uh, getting close I I think uh, the position that I'm in is uh, a pretty good one if they really are 25% of the server market that would be awesome uh, but um, they're not right now not yet um, I mean not, 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 not even not they haven't even. really started yet kind of. yeah I mean so, so to get to to get to that scale um, you have to learn a lot of things really fast. And I think that by providing this software directory and this community that we can get people there. But yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ambitious target. I'm, um, you know, I, I wish them well. I, I wish them all the good things. And I wish you well too. Thank it's you. It's gonna be interesting to follow and see what, what, what comes out of it in yeah, the yeah. new future. Cool.